Bosh Kawalik, I'm Frank Blanket. Welcome to FedEx Now. In 1996, the state of California passed Proposition 209 as an initiated constitutional amendment. The proposition added Section 31 to the California Constitution's Declaration of Rights, which said that the state cannot discriminate against or grant preferential treatment on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, and public contracting. Though that might sound anti-discriminatory towards minority communities, women, and people of color, Proposition 209 also banned the use of affirmative action, which guaranteed consideration to underrepresented groups and thus statistically directly affected Black, Latinx, and Native American communities in attending colleges and universities, being considered for jobs, and government contracts. This November, Proposition 16 aims to return the Affirmative Action Initiative to California by overturning Prop 209, which poses the question, can affirmative action reduce racial and ethnic inequities? Today's panel was put together by Ethnic Media Services. Let's go to our moderator, Pilar Marrero. Thanks, everyone. We're going to go right into the topic. Um, to speak about this issue of affirmative action in Prop 16. So I'm going to give the floor to uh, Thomas Sanz, President and General Counsel of, Mex of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Tom, floor is yours. Thank you, Pilar, and thank you all for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to begin the conversation, but I begin by pointing out what we have all experienced over the last six plus months, and that is an unprecedented 2020 with a pandemic that none of us have experienced previously, with a tremendous economic recession caused by that pandemic and the steps taken to restrict public health uh, dangers. And more recently, of course, a Black Lives Movement uh, reinvigorated across the country uh, because of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, what has been a common theme in all of this experience, I think, is a greater discussion nationwide and recognition of the enduring ongoing effects of systemic injustice and discrimination. So we have seen, for example, that the pandemic has shown higher rates of infection and death in all populations of people of color, African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. Uh, we have seen that the economic recession has particularly hit communities of color with job loss, reductions in wages, and the like. And we have seen with the reinvigorated Black Lives Matter movement, greater acknowledgement across the board in all sectors of the ongoing effects of systemic discrimination in our law enforcement practices. That has highlighted uh, the issue that is addressed directly by Proposition 16. To give you an example related to what I've just described, uh, any city or county in the state of California that might conclude in response to the demonstrations that we have seen across the country that sought to increase it's hiring, for example, of African-American or Latino police officers or sheriff's deputies in California could not, could not engage in targeted recruitment or hiring of Black, Latino, or Asian-American police officers. In other cities and counties throughout the country, in response to this movement, cities and counties could engage in carefully narrowed but targeted recruitment and hiring of African-American, Latino, or Asian-American officers or deputies. In California, we cannot take that step, and that is solely because of Proposition 209, the ballot measure that would be repealed by Proposition 16 on our November ballot. To remind you all, Proposition 209 was enacted in 1996 by 55% of the California vote. It was misleadingly labeled the California Civil Rights Initiative and placed on the ballot by folks led by Ward Connolly a UC regent who was appointed by Governor Pete Wilson. It was very much a divisive measure on the ballot. We know from the LA Times exit poll that supermajorities of voters of color voted no on Proposition 209. Specifically, that exit poll indicated that 76% of Latino voters voted no on Proposition 209. 74% of African American voters voted no on Proposition 209. 61% of Asian American voters voted no on Proposition 209. Indeed, a majority of women voters of all races, 52% voted no on Proposition 209. Nonetheless, as I said, because of a notorious mismatch between the population of California 
and those who went to the polls in November of 1996, despite those super majorities of voters of color against, Proposition 209 was enacted by 55% of the vote. What Prop 209 did was to add a paragraph to our state constitution prohibiting the use of affirmative action techniques, race conscious, gender conscious affirmative action techniques in public education, public employment, and public contracting. You'll hear later about the impacts in other areas, but I want to note that in the area of public education, Proposition 209 has affected what we can do both in kindergarten through 12th grade public schools and in higher education. Perhaps most notoriously, the immediate impact of Proposition 209 was a dramatic drop in the number of African-American and Latino students at our University of California campuses. Perhaps most notoriously, the University of California at Berkeley Law School ended up with only one African-American student in the first class selected after Proposition 209, and that individual had actually been admitted previously and deferred his enrollment. But today, 24 years later, we continue to see the impacts of Proposition 209. I'll give you just one statistic. Today in California, African-American and Latino students make up 60% of 12th graders in our public schools statewide. 60% of those who are high school seniors and on the cusp of going on to higher education. And yet, at our University of California system-wide, African-Americans and Latinos make up only 29% of undergraduates. 60% of 12th graders, only 29% of UC undergraduates at all campuses. And that's a measure of the dramatic disparities that we continue to see in the state of California and that we are not able to address aggressively because of Proposition 209. But I do want to highlight what else has changed in 24 years. First, the demographics of our voters have changed. So those supermajorities in opposition to Proposition 209 among African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans, if those percentages apply today, the outcome would have been different because today, voters of color comprise 42 to 43% of all registered voters in the state of California. That's substantially higher than it was in 1996. So such a racially divisive measure would not have the same outcome as we saw 24 years ago. But something else has changed in 24 years, and that is our United States Supreme Court has weighed in on a number of occasions about race conscious, gender conscious affirmative action programs in public education, public employment, and public contracting. Specifically, in the ensuing 24 years since 1996, the US Supreme Court has addressed affirmative action in higher education twice in the University of Michigan cases, Gratz and Grutter, and after that, twice more in the same case of Fisher versus University of Texas. In the area of employment, in the Ricci case versus the city of New Haven, in 2009, the US Supreme Court has addressed affirmative action in employment. The upshot of all of this is that the US Supreme Court has become much more descriptive about what is permitted and what is required in pursuing affirmative action. First of all, even before Prop 209, we know that the US Supreme Court has prohibited anyone from using quotas or set-asides based on race or gender in any of these public realms. Since 1978, a case called Bakke versus University of California, out of Davis Medical School, the US Supreme Court has made clear that we cannot anywhere in this country employ quotas or set-asides based on race or gender. But more recently in the cases I've described, the US Supreme Court has made it clear that any public policy-making entity interested in using affirmative action must first go through a rigorous analysis and consideration of policy changes before it may put in place a narrowly tailored program to consider race or gender. The US Supreme Court has considerably narrowed the circumstances under which anyone can employ race or gender conscious affirmative action. And those restrictions would apply in the state of California even after Proposition 16 is enacted. What is required is a rigorous examination of disparities, like the percentages that I described between 12th graders and UC undergrads. Anybody interested in implementing affirmative action must look carefully at those disparities, identify the causes of those disparities, and consider whether there are race neutral and gender neutral approaches to addressing those disparities before 
an entity can consider a race or gender conscious affirmative action program. And what that means is that some of the most important progress from Prop 16 may well be in the form of changes that are race neutral or gender neutral that result from that rigorous analysis and policy consideration mandated, mandatory in California by the US Supreme Court. So for example, we might see race neutral, gender neutral changes in admissions criteria with positive effects for all races and genders created as a result of Proposition 16. The problem you see is that Proposition 209 has prevented the University of California and other public entities from engaging in the rigorous analysis and policy consideration required by the US Supreme Court because in the end of implementing affirmative action. And as we all know, no politician wants to highlight an issue like racial or gender disparities if they then are prevented from putting a solution in place. So because Proposition 209 has prevented us from considering any affirmative action programs, our policymakers have simply not engaged in that rigorous analysis of racial and gender disparities, engaged in that careful consideration of policy approaches, including race and gender neutral approaches to addressing those disparities. We have basically been prevented in this state from engaging in that kind of careful consideration of what we all now see as a result of the pandemic, the recession, and the Black Lives Matter movement. It's for this reason that we believe that opportunity for all Californians will be promoted by the passage of Proposition 16. It will enable all of our policymakers to engage. Indeed, it will put great pressure on our policymakers to engage in that rigorous analysis and careful consideration that the US Supreme Court has described. With that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you. We have a question in the chat from Henrietta. Henrietta Burroughs. Thanks so much, Pilar. Um, given the analysis that you're talking about, how would race and gender neutral measures lead to a more equitable solution? I should point out that I think ultimately they will not provide a complete solution, but they would provide a partial solution. I'll give you an example. So for example, the University of California has recently decided not to require standardized tests. Now part of the reason is that those standardized tests show a dramatic discriminatory impact on African American and Latino students. And those tests do not correlate with success in a university education other than first year grades. So no strong correlation with success and yet a dramatic discriminatory effect. So one race neutral approach would be to abandon the use of standardized tests at all in university admissions. That is a race neutral decision because it does not involve consciousness of race or gender in making decisions about who's admitted. It would simply eliminate a biased criteria. But there are others. For example, the University of California continues to use weighted GPAs, even though access to the honors level IB, AP courses that allow you to get a higher GPA, even though access differs from high school to high school. Another example, the University of California does not control for what subconscious bias may affect teacher recommendations. A race neutral and gender neutral measure might be to look for ways to control for subconscious bias among recommenders. So all of these are the kind of steps that could result from a rigorous analysis of disparities and a careful consideration of all steps, starting with race neutral, gender neutral as mandated by the US Supreme Court, but ultimately involving the very limited and narrow consideration of race or gender in making admissions decisions. Thank you, Tom. So now we're gonna hear from Eva Eva, I pronounced it in Spanish, Eva Patterson, president and founder of the Equal Justice Society, a national legal organization focused on civil rights and anti-discrimination. Eva, welcome. Good morning. I want to riff off something that the comedian and social commentary, person does social commentary, Trevor Noah said something that really resonated with me. He said that because we were all at home, watching TV, we didn't have the distraction of sports or anything else. All of America saw the murder of Mr. George Floyd. And this allowed 
with many white Americans to take the blinders off their eyes. We've heard nonsensical comments like, I don't see color, that's absurd. We're in post-racial America, that's absurd. Racism's over, that's absurd. By seeing a man murdered for eight minutes by a police officer, people really got it. One of the side effects of the murder of Mr. George Floyd is that people are talking about systemic racism. I am a big football fan. I know that's not good, but I love football and I love Colin Kaepernick. Um, and I was absolutely stunned to see and hear Roger Goodell, the man who's harassed Colin Kaepernick and Mr. Reed, talk about systemic racism. And I just went, what, did I hear that? And so I think a lot of people are playing, paying lip service to the notion of systemic racism, but Proposition 16 actually deals with systemic racism. How? Let me tell you how. One of the ways our communities um, get the bad impacts of systemic racism is we don't have sufficient political power. We have the numbers, um, but we don't have money to contribute to campaigns, to have lobbyists. And so we do not get our interests adequately taken care of by the political system. This is part of systemic racism. Um, we all know that if you have a better education, you get a better job, you have more income, your kids go to better schools, you actually get health care, so your life is longer. So there are all kinds of very concrete positive benefits of having a better education. Similarly, with employment, if you have a good job, all the things I just talked about flow to you and your family and your community. Another thing is that looking at race and gender will allow more people to get promoted. There is a glass ceiling. I've heard an Asian American friend talk about the bamboo ceiling. At one of the hearings in the Senate, there was a Chinese American doctor, I think his name was Dr. Pan, who said that while there are many Asian American doctors, there is not one medical school in the United States that has an Asian American dean. So we see that despite the fact that many of us do very well, there are overt biases, there are unconscious biases that result in us not getting ahead. The final piece of this that very few people talk about is the contracting piece. Many Asian American businesses were horribly harmed at the beginning of COVID-19 because people were prejudiced against Asian American businesses. We had a commander in chief calling it the China flu. And so people wouldn't go to Asian American businesses. So we've seen that businesses have been harmed. And so, this was all, these were all direct consequences of Proposition 209. Before I go into Proposition 2016, uh, rather, I want to talk about something that I was, that went across my mind this morning as I was preparing my remarks. I actually think that the people who pushed Proposition 209 were terrified at the increasing numbers of Latinos in California. And the notion that there would have to be parity and equality, I think, scared them to death. And I think this was one of the motivating factors behind Proposition 209. I also think they played on prejudice about African Americans. Last year, we commemorated the 400th anniversary of the first enslaved Africans landing at Jamestown. My best friend, Shauna Marshall, and I were on a panel talking about this. And she said something that's obvious, but I hadn't thought about it. She said the only way that Africans could be enslaved, sold, lynched, raped, was for us to be seen as less than human. That prejudice has carried through to the present day. I think a lot of what was behind Proposition 209 were negative stereotypes about African Americans. We're lazy, we're dumb, we shouldn't be able to get into these high schools of higher education, so stop this affirmative action. So let me talk somewhat about the results of Proposition 209. My alma mater, Berkeley Law School, when I entered Berkeley Law in 1972, there were 30 black students in my class. The year after affirmative action came into effect, 
there was only one student, Eric Brooks. Imagine the ripple effect of having 29 fewer African Americans getting that high caliber legal education at UC Berkeley. Let me talk about the educational piece. Um, the state personnel board tried to make sure that there was not discrimination against women and people of color. And they instituted a program that would have qualified people of color and women employed. That was struck down by the courts because of Proposition 209. That was resulted in a whole bunch of qualified women and people of color who didn't get good government jobs. So the lady who talked about the educational implications of Proposition 209 and Proposition 16, Dr. Shirley Weber was the author of, Prop, of what became Proposition 16. In San Diego, she tried to institute a STEM program for girls, science, technology, engineering, and math. That program had to be discontinued because of Proposition 209. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Hidden Figures about the black women who helped get people into space. That went on when I was in high school. I knew nothing about that. I was a little nerd and did well in chemistry. I might well be an astrophysicist today and not talking to you about Proposition 16 had there been programs focused for girls and African Americans that showed the broad uh, array of possibilities for us. The last thing I'll say about Proposition 209 is the following, and this is a dire concern to all communities. As a result of Proposition 209, businesses owned by women and people of color have lost a billion dollars a year. Asian American, Latino, Native American, African American, and women owned firms lost a billion dollars a year. And that is a low ball estimate. Imagine what would have happened in our communities had that money from our tax dollars that we pay gone into our pockets. We tend to hire our own people. So just imagine the ripple effects. That is a concrete problem that flows from Proposition 209. So Proposition 16 is going to be on the ballot on November 3rd. Um, there are certain people, if they stand for this initiative, it clarifies it. And people go, I don't understand when I read it. But if John Legend, the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, Kamala Harris, Dr. Martin Luther King's, uh, King's daughter, the PTA, Chambers of Commerce around the state, all male professional sports teams in the Bay Area, 49ers, uh, A's, uh, Giants, Sharks, I don't know um, hockey so well, and there's probably a soccer team in there, um, but all the male sports teams endorse Proposition 16. So once people know who the validators are, they quickly come to our side. When people know that Trump opposes affirmative action, people come to our side. Latinos who were not born in 1996 know Pete Wilson and remember Proposition 187. And when they learn that he is against Proposition 16, people go, oh no, we're not gonna be aligned with him. We're voting yes on Proposition 16. You all are ACE reporters, so I'm sure you saw the Public Policy Institute polling that came out on Wednesday. It showed that we are below 50%. Our initial polling, and we've been polling since 2008, but the polling we did last August showed exactly the same thing, that we're below 50%. What we have done, though, is through focus group work and polling, we have shown that if people know what this is about, we get up to 53, 56%. So I'm so delighted to be talking to all of you today. I'm sure there are people out there who don't like affirmative action. Um, there's no right or wrong, although I think we're right in terms of Proposition 16. The voters ultimately get to decide. Some of the legislators who voted to put this on the ballot said, let's let the voters decide. So let's let the voters decide on November 3rd. We think they'll vote the right way. We hope you will send out accurate information. I'm sure you will. And once again, it's an honor uh, to speak before all of you. I'm so sorry that journalists have been attacked, um, but we've got your back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to call on Frank Blanquette. Thank you, Pilar. Eva, as ethnic and minority media 
we understand the disparities and biases that exists towards our communities from potential employers, schools, and sadly, the way we might receive health care and the way we're policed. But from a voter standpoint, how do you justify and advocate for Prop 16, a race-based proposition and affirmative action to white voters? How do you, for lack of a better word, sell them on the idea, or should they see it as a race-based proposition at all? Um, even before the murder of Mr. George Floyd, the majority of white Americans approved affirmative action programs. I was stunned. I thought they'll never approve it. They were already there. It's even got, their support's even gotten more robust after the murder of Mr. Floyd because they see, hey, there are some real problems here and we need to do something. So we think w white women, we think we can get to because we, we will talk about gender, but we're just going to be straight up saying there are problems. Affirmative action is a way to deal with it. People are harmed because of their race or in this ethnicity, and this is a way to start to cancel out that harm. There are some white people who get it, and there are some people of color who don't. Well, thank you very much for in increasing our understanding of this issue and to our colleagues for asking such good questions. Thank you, Pilar. The Public Policy Institute of California poll found that 46% of Democratic voters, 9% of Republican voters, and 26% of independents support Proposition 16. In totality, however, this same poll found that only 31% of voters would vote in favor, 47% of respondents would vote no, and 22% are undecided. A detailed breakdown of responses by race was not provided, but among those respondents who were neither white nor Latino, 40% supported the measure and 38% opposed it. For FNX Now, I'm Frank Blanquette. Dios Boutique, thank you for watching.